Hello and welcome. I am Pastor Edwin Weber, and I am leading this week's uh, Sunday Forum. Welcome, everyone, to our new series for this fall. Um, We are calling this series for our Sunday Forums, Faithfulness in Times of Loss. Uh, And this is connected to um, our vocation project. Um, You may remember that this year's theme is called to trust God's future. And we are focusing in on the stories of the exile. In this period of biblical history, uh, things changed dramatically for God's people. Their expectations about where God was in the world and how God called people were challenged. And the grief of those changes was overwhelming. For over 70 years, God's people lived in exile, forbidden to return to their homeland. And their initial grief of this loss eventually gave way to other questions. Questions about things like, well, how do we live as a people, maintaining our own identity and culture and beliefs? When those who rule over us, they want us to assimilate into their culture and empire. Now, we have the benefit of looking back on Jewish history and knowing that this was just temporary. But with the people who lived through the exile, this was anything but certain. How do you maintain hope in the face of so much uncertainty? Over this next year, we want to further explore these themes that arise from the exile through our sacred storytelling and the prophetic words that we find in Holy Scripture. But as we examine the stories that come from this period lived by our spiritual ancestors, we wanted to start at the beginning and look at how the exile happened and the initial reality that God's people faced being conquered by a foreign power. Uh, The thing is, you know, reading the Bible, one thing is clear. The exile didn't just happen overnight. When we read the stories of the Davidic kingdom, whether from the Bible or from historical accounts, one is given the impression that David and Solomon, they reigned over a golden age for God's people in the United Kingdom of Israel. And that the house of David in Judah in subsequent generations represent a slow fall from that golden period. Many of the kings worshipped other gods. And we know that commandment number one is, you shall have no other gods before me. The ruling class became wealthy and complacent. They ignored the plight of their poor neighbors in violation of the commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, God sends prophets to warn when we go astray. And long before the exile was certain, the prophet Amos was sent as a warning to the wealthy ruling class that God would judge them if they continued to ignore the poor. This is from uh, Amos chapter 6. Alas, for those who lie on beds of ivory and lounge on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David improvise on instruments of music, who drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph, Therefore, they shall now be the first to go into exile, and the revelry of the loungers shall pass away. None of us can say that God didn't warn them. And Amos was right. It would be the leaders who would be the first to go into exile. But God didn't warn the people just once. God sent other prophets 
Uh, The prophet Isaiah was close friends with King Hezekiah, but even he couldn't get through to him. This is from uh, 2 Kings 20. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your ancestors have stored up until this day shall be carried away to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Some of your own sons who are born to you shall be taken away. They shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord you have spoken is good. For he thought, why not, if there will be peace and security in my days? Hezekiah is utterly indifferent, entirely because he knows he will never leave to live to see the consequences of his inaction. I wonder if that reminds us of anything that we face as people of God today. King after king, prophet after prophet, the message never got through. God's people had long lived under the shadow of the empires that surrounded it, even making alliances with them from time to time. But the political interests of empire and the drive for conquest and wealth were but tools of God's judgment. It was Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon who ultimately conquered Jerusalem. At first, the temple was looted. The leaders, artisans, and warriors were deported to Babylon, and a puppet government was installed. But when God's people fought one last time, For their independence, Jerusalem was besieged for two years before the walls came down. When the city fell, the last of David's line was executed. The temple was destroyed. Jerusalem raised and its remaining inhabitants forcibly removed from their homes. I wonder what it must have been like to face exile as God's people in in those days. Such loss and grief must have been experienced. Imagine sending your young sons off to fight a war, only to die and to lose that war, to have your home destroyed, your place of worship destroyed, to have your government and independence as a nation ended. This represents a massive, earth-shattering change in reality for God's people, which cannot be understated. Uh, I might use the word, I might call it disillusionment. The profound feeling of disappointment resulting from discovering that things are not always what one believes it to be. We're going to be exploring some of these things together over the next few weeks. But today, I specifically wanted to focus in on this notion, this loss of trusted leaders. Because a big part of the disillusionment of God's people was that they had leaders who they had trusted in. And by leaders, I specifically, of course, mean the kings. That is who led God's people in this time. Uh, Way back before they had a king, when God's people first asked God for a king, they said that they wanted a king who would go out and fight their battles for them. That uh, always makes me chuckle because um, it's not like kings actually do that, of course. But I get that perspective. Uh, One of the nice things about having leaders is that we have somebody to blame when things go wrong. And yet... We are all given positions of authority and privilege in our lives at times. And we all have opportunities to misuse 
and abuse that privilege or authority. Why would we expect the kings to be any different than the rest of us? Now, when David came to reign unopposed as the king of the United Kingdom of Israel, we're told that God made a covenant with David, that David and his descendants would sit on the throne of Israel forever, and then exile. And suddenly, there is no longer a king of David's line in Jerusalem. And in fact, there is no more Jerusalem at all, or even a throne to sit upon considering that your nation had been assumed by an empire. What were God's people supposed to make of this? If God's covenant with David didn't hold true, could that mean that other covenants made between God and us are in jeopardy? And what despair that must have been to have that thought. The thing is, there is a difference between the covenants, uh, the different types of gov- covenants that God is making here. The covenants of Genesis and Exodus are made with everybody and are super inclusive. For example, they're made with Adam and Eve, the progenitors of all humanity, made with Noah and the animals and all of creation. They're made with Abraham and Sarah and all their descendants forever. A covenant is made with Moses and all those who kept the law. These are universal covenants. While the covenant between David and God was something different. This is not the first covenant God made with a king. God made a similar covenant with Saul But it was always conditional. And when Saul disobeyed God multiple times, the covenant was revoked. Now David and David's sons, they knew this. They knew that covenants with kings are always conditional. When Solomon dedicated the temple, he prayed this really long prayer Uh, And in this prayer, in part of it, he acknowledges this fact, acknowledges that the the, uh, covenant is conditional, and he does this before God and all the people. This is uh, from 1 Kings 8. Solomon prayed, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their heart. The covenant that you kept for your servant, my father David, as you declared to him, you promised with your mouth and have this day fulfilled with your hand. Therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep for your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, saying, there shall never fail you a successor before me to sit on the throne of Israel, if only... Your children look to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. The stark reality here is that not all the kings walked the path they were called to. And despite repeated warnings, generation after generation of covenant-breaking kings God finally broke the covenant. But what about those larger, universal covenants God made with humanity, the whole earth, and all of God's people? And this is is where our despair gives way to hope. Because the larger covenants of grace are not conditional. They are not conditional on political rulers, or the strengths of armies. They're not conditional on cultural or economic dominance, or even conditional on independence and freedom. The covenants of grace are larger than life itself, and we need only look to Jesus, the son of David, 
and His coming everlasting kingdom to see that truth. There is always hope in the face of despair. That same prayer that I I quoted Solomon from earlier, he keeps on going. He'll go on to say, If we ever sin against you, God, for there is no one who is without sin, and you are angry with us, and turn us over to the hands of our enemies, so that we are carried away captive to the land of our enemies. If we come to our sins in the land in which we are captive and repent with all our hearts, then forgive your people and grant them freedom. There is always hope. Solomon knew it. Christ's followers on Easter knew it. And we know it too, people of God.